You still have a place for me in your heart? Brett asked. Yes. I was only with Jim because I had no choice, Yasmin whined. He was the one who took the initiative with me. He looked her in the eye and asked, If I'm so important to you, then tell me, what's my favorite fruit? Huh? She started to stammer. After a moment, she said, Oranges? Fraser laughed when he heard her. Oranges? Even I know that Brett loves watermelon the most, he said. Brett, who had already given up on her, waved at the guards and told them to drag her out. After that, they changed the technology company's name back to its original label, Frandotech. In the chairman's office, Brett turned to Fraser and asked, Where did you get the money to buy the company? I'm afraid I can't reveal my source, Fraser replied. You're being quite mysterious. What are you going to do next? Brett asked. I'm going to deal with the Philly group. The good days are over for that father and son pair. Fraser spoke with determination. The news that Fraser and Brett had taken over their old company again quickly spread through the city, and Brett became an idol in the hearts of many single girls. The following day, there was chaos in the offices at the Philly group. The company had been inundated with complaints from clients, and even the security guards had been given the job of answering the phones. Mose pointed at them and shouted, All of you, work hard and don't make any mistakes. Otherwise, your commission for this month will be gone. Everyone had been busy since four o'clock and hadn't eaten breakfast. They were exhausted, but didn't dare to take a break for fear of losing their commissions. Mose went up to his father's office. Victor was at his desk, emptying the contents of his drawers into cardboard boxes. Mose asked, Dad, can the company be saved? 70% of our clients have reported problems with the quality of their properties. Someone is definitely behind all of this. Victor said, I want you to get ready to meet the new boss. The new boss? Dad, are you kidding? Our company has a pile of lawsuits, so why would anyone want to take it over? Mose asked, confused. Yesterday, I spoke to a potential buyer from some company called Frandotech. He didn't seem to know what was going on here, so I just said a few words to him and he agreed to take over the company. I've already booked a flight out of the country. Once we're done with this, why don't you come with me and hide away for a while? Victor offered. Victor had been intelligent. He had realized that the situation wasn't looking good and had already prepared his escape route. Hearing that someone had come to their rescue, Mose felt relieved. A staff member knocked on the door and said, Mr. Ferlin, there's someone in reception who wishes to see you. His name is Brett Andrews. Mose, the new boss is here, Victor said. The pair made their way down to the reception area, which was bustling with noise and excitement after the arrival of their guests. The people who saw him started to speculate about his reason for being there. Didn't that guy work here with his wife? What's he doing back here? An employee said. He's probably here to beg for their jobs back, another voice sounded. The guy with him looks as if he's unemployed too. There were a lot of such comments. Brett was angry when he heard them. Stop your chattering and get your boss down here, he shouted. Because he was with Frazier, who was regarded as a loser, he wasn't taken seriously. The manager who had taken over Peter's position asked, Do you think Mr. Ferlin would want to see you? If you do, you think too much of yourself. Someone call security. The security guards arrived and were about to throw them out when Victor and Mose arrived. Stop that, Victor shouted. Do you know what you're doing? The manager said, Mr. Ferlin, this person was demanding to see you. He obviously had no reason to be here, so I asked security to kick him out. Victor said, Well, you've made a big mistake. He's your new boss, Mr. Andrews. The manager was stunned. 
Isn't he Frazier's friend? He thought. How can he be the new boss? Mr. Furlan seems to have gone crazy. Brett said, Mr. Furlan, is this any way for me to be treated? I think you should deal with the staff before I take it over. He pretended to be annoyed and gave the impression that he was about to leave. Victor looked worried and immediately said, Mr. Andrews, hold on. The company only has one errant employee and I'll kick him out. Victor looked sullenly at the manager and said, a competent employee of this company wouldn't disrespect his boss. You have no place here. The manager realized that he had misjudged the situation and that Brett was his new boss. He had only just taken up his position as manager, yet he was already facing dismissal. He begged Victor to change his mind. Victor was unmoved and waved to a security guard who dragged the manager outside. The reception area became quiet. Mose, who had been in a daze, returned to his senses and pointed at Fraser. Fraser, why are you here? What is your relationship with Mr. Andrews? He asked. Brett said, Mr. Furlan, you've misunderstood the situation. He and I don't know each other. He explained that he and Fraser had arrived independently. Fraser pretended not to know Brett and said, Mr. Andrews, I heard that this company owes you a huge debt of gratitude. If you take over the company, you'll have to clean up a huge mess for them. Brett pretended to be shocked. Oh, a huge mess? What do you mean? He turned to Victor and said, Mr. Furlan, what are you hiding from me? Victor was mortified. He quickly said, Mr. Andrews, don't listen to his nonsense. Our company is healthy and has no external debt. He was telling the truth. There was no debt, but there were plenty of lawsuits. Is that so? said Brett, sounding doubtful. Mose also became anxious. He knew how important it was to get the deal done. He accepted that it was impossible for Fraser to know the boss of Frandotac, so he tried to dispel any doubts about the company. Mr. Andrews, I was mistaken. This person used to be an employee of our company. We kicked him out due to his poor character. He has a grievance against us, so you shouldn't trust what he says. All right, I'll take your word for it and sign the contract, Brett said. He chatted and smiled with the Furlins as he entered the company's offices. Mose hung back and gave Fraser an evil smile. Do you honestly think you can cause problems here? He asked. You're overestimating yourself. Unless Natalia comes and begs me, I'm going to make sure you get everything you've got coming to you. I'm leaving the country after this anyway, Mose thought as he regarded Fraser. It's not like this is going to be a problem. Fraser's eyes turned cold. He still wants my wife, he thought. Well, he's not going to get her. It's time to pull this plant out by the roots and get rid of him. It's amusing that he thinks I'm incompetent. Just you wait, Fraser said quietly. Oh, are you threatening me? Mose asked mockingly. The door opened and the senior administrators entered the room. Victor stepped up to the microphone. Can I have everyone's attention? He asked. I'm pleased to announce that, as of this moment, President Andrews is your new boss. Let's all give him a warm welcome. The gathered employees clapped loudly. More than one had been anxiously awaiting a change in management. Mose and Victor had not treated their employees well. Everyone was looking forward to new leadership. While everyone was still applauding, Fraser walked up to Brett, nodded at his partner, and took the contract letter. Mose, Victor, he said cordially, thank you for transferring your company to us, but it appears that your flight tomorrow morning was booked for nothing. Mose looked at his father in astonishment. How did Fraser know about the flight? Mose thought. And what does he mean about it being booked for nothing? Mose saw his own confusion reflected in his father's face. They suddenly heard the sound of sirens approaching. Victor felt a cold prickle of panic run down his spine. You two planned this, 
he said to Fraser and Brett. I sold my company for less than it's worth, and I can't even skip town as I'd planned, he thought. You gambled and lost, Fraser replied. And now you're paying the price for your sins. I really do owe them, as I said, he thought. Just not in the way that they thought. Moses' face turned pale as he realized what the sirens meant. Fraser knew everything, he realized. He plays the idiot, but it's all an act. How else could he have outsmarted us? The police entered the building and wasted no time in handcuffing and taking both Mose and Victor back out to the waiting squad cars. After the police had left, Fraser and Brett calmly discussed some business matters before each went home for the evening. On Saturday, Sheila had to go to work, and Lynn was busy with exams. Natalia found herself alone at home with Fraser. She nestled on the couch and browsed through job listings, trying to find a job for her husband. He walked into the living room. What are you doing? He asked her. Oh, I'm getting you a job, she replied. You can't sit around at home every day for much longer, you know. I know. I'll consider whichever job you think is best. By the way, how's your new job going? It's not bad. They treat me well, and my colleagues are nice to work with, but... She trailed off and looked wistfully out the window. But what? Fraser was genuinely curious. She looked at him and saw that he was focused on listening to her. But I want to have my own company someday. I want to be the boss. I know it's a lot of hard work, and it's challenging. But I think it would be really rewarding. Like, heavily. I see, he grinned. So, after you become the boss, I can legitimately be a kept man, right? You wish, she sighed. Don't listen to me. Sometimes I just spout random nonsense. It's not easy being the boss. Listen, if it's something you want, then you should work on it. We can make this dream come true. She looked at him, bemused. Why are you so smart today? He shrugged and she turned back to the listings. Look here, she said, pointing to one. This company looks pretty good. Here, I'll forward it to you, and you can send them your resume. Okay, thank you, dear. Fraser appreciated her concern. He glanced at the name and number of the random small business and left the room. Fraser wanted to spend time with his wife, but he had to call Brett and discuss business matters. Although before he could make the call, he received a message from Ryan, who reported that he had been making progress with the Three Eyes gang but there was trouble that he needed help dealing with. A short time later, Fraser arrived at the nightclub where the gang operated from. The building was huge, and Ryan waited at the door. I've been able to recruit about 70% of the original gang, Ryan said as they walked through the entryway. But I underestimated the top members, the lieutenants. They all want to be the gang boss, and they're not willing to stand down. Is anyone talking about who killed Gary Mendez? Fraser asked. There's been some speculation, but mostly they're talking about who's going to take his place. And as far as I'm concerned, they're all traitors. Ryan was so upset, he almost punched the wall. Don't blame yourself, Fraser said. You can't fight them all. On the contrary, you've done well to accomplish all that you have already. Now that the whole gang is gathered, the troublemakers will come out of the woodwork. It's time for a reckoning. With Ryan leading the way, they came to the end of the corridor. A large private room had been hastily converted into what looked like a conference area. All of the lieutenants were sitting inside, waiting impatiently. Ryan pushed the door open. It banged loudly against the opposite wall. The person sitting closest to the door jumped up and cursed. <laughs> Dang, Ryan, you got a death wish or something? Nah, look at him, another man drawled. He's about to pee his pants because he tried so hard to rope everyone together, and it just took a few words from us to dissolve the little army he'd built. Is that it, Ryan? 
Are you scared of us? Another gangster raised his voice. Ryan wasn't afraid as he stepped to the side so that Fraser could enter the room. He had confidence in Fraser's abilities. The fighting technique that Fraser had displayed previously still sent chills down his spine whenever he thought about it. Everyone noticed the stranger enter the room. What are you doing, bringing an outsider with you? One of the men asked belligerently. Looks like he's colluding with outsiders and getting greedy, another replied. I guess we'll have to clean up his mess and avenge our leader. They all laughed wickedly and stood up. How could they think I'd ever ask for outside help? Ryan thought indignantly. Doesn't loyalty mean anything to them? Not to mention, not a single man who had said they'd support me has stood up for me. My apologies for the interruption, Fraser said as he stepped forward. But I was the one who killed Mr. Mendez. The room instantly fell deathly silent. The gang members glanced at one another. They all knew that their boss had been killed by a man wearing a black mask, but no one knew the specifics. One man laughed harshly. <laughs> Stop talking nonsense, he said. Just you? You think you could even get close to him all by yourself? Ryan, you're an idiot, another said. You think you can go against all of us with just one random person? The men in the room were not a united force, and each had their own ulterior motive, but none would agree to hand over the top position to an outsider. They each knew that any single one of them had a claim to authority, and they would not relinquish it easily. Someone gave a signal, and suddenly the entrance of the room was densely packed with subordinates. Ryan's gaze flicked around the room nervously. Well, we're not leaving here, that's for sure, he thought. We're probably going to die here today. He looked at Fraser, who seemed calm. That's right, Fraser said. I'm going to fight all ten of you. Fraser wasn't a victim of blind confidence. He eyed each of the men when he walked into the room. They might have once been mighty fighters, he thought, but years of being the head honchos have made them weak. They haven't had to fight for a position in a long time. The room erupted into laughter. <laughs> Are you for real, man? Someone asked. <laughs> you you want to challenge us? Seriously, said another. Even if Mendez were still alive, he wouldn't dare boast like that. I like your style, big man, but that arrogance needs to be taken down a notch. Another large man threatened Fraser. Ryan was stunned. What is he thinking, he thought. He can't be serious. One versus ten, and these are no common street thugs. These are the guys who helped Gary Mendez build his gang back in the day. One man sitting in the back stood up, and the table shook when he put his foot down. Let me get him, he growled as he stomped forward. Ryan took a step back. That's Ox, he thought as he recognized the man. The gangster was named for his noticeable size and strength. Rumor had it Ox could kill a cow with three punches. Back when he was fighting with Mendez, even mentioning his name was enough to make opponents retreat. Hey guys, Fraser here. Listen to the full episode of Unraveling the Son-in-Law exclusively on Pocket FM app. Click the link in description to install the app now.